Welcome to the Astute Class Subbrief. This is the Royal Navy's most recent entry into submarine warfare. Uh, it is, they're built to replace the Trafalgar class submarines that served for many years throughout the Cold War and post-Cold War era. Right now, five are commissioned and two more are under construction, being built by BAE Systems. They measure just under 100 meters long and 7,400 tons when dived. They are nuclear-powered submarines with six torpedo tubes on the bow, no VLS, and but they're capable of carrying 38 weapons, uh, whether missiles or torpedoes. They do shoot the Tomahawk Block 4 land attack missile and the Spearfish heavyweight torpedo. We'll be diving into all those in detail in this lecture. Let's begin with the sensors. They have the uh, 7415 communication ESM for listening in on conversations while offshore in shallow waters or in the vicinity of other ships. The radar ESM is the UAA-4, uh, very good at precisely pinpointing the direction a transmission is coming from, whether it's aviation or another ship or some kind of shore-based facility. It just gives them the bearing and signal strength and stuff like that. They can also record it and we'll go into all that. The optotronics mast is what the new periscopes are called. Uh, they're literally electronic television cameras with a screen, thus optotronic instead of periscope. But the biggest thing from a crewman's point of view or a submariner's point of view is a, is a non-penetrating mast. It is a mast that is entirely housed in the sail and doesn't penetrate the pressure hull, which means you don't have a big hole in the pressure hull that can flood if it takes damage. Uh, this entire optotronics mast is outside of that pressure hull and stowed inside the sail. They do have satellite communications, a fantastic 2766 sonar suite that we'll talk about in detail, and the DASO 25 echo sounder, which is essentially the fathometer. As for weapons, like we said, six torpedo tubes on the bow, all 53 centimeters, so they can shoot all NATO weapons. And uh, they shoot the Tomahawk Block 4, land attack, cruise missile, and the Spearfish torpedo. Here are the seven ships that they're going to build. At the time of this recording, five are commissioned, two are under construction. And these are very good builds. These are very quiet submarines, very fast, carry a big punch. Uh, having the 36 weapons or so in uh, in the torpedo room means they can engage and stay on station after the engagement. They don't need to return to port every time they get into a fight. Uh, they can stay in, in the battle in theater for an extended period of time, being nuclear powered, lots of weapons, really only, only limited by food because they even make their own fresh water. So really, really incredible. One thing I want you to notice on this picture to the right is the shape of the bow around where the sonar system would go. It is not round like American submarines. It is, uh, it's, it's angular, and that's for um, it, a couple different things. One of the things it does is when active sonar hits it, it reflects that sonar in a different direction from where it came. That way it reduces the active sonar signature of this uh, submarine. There's other advantages to that too, but that's really the big one. It's made in the UK, uh, BAE Systems at Furness. I love this picture of it being rolled out. That's called an assembly building. They literally build it there. It comes in in sections. So each hull section can be made somewhere else and trucked in one at a time where they just stack the sections together laterally, left and right. And of course, one of the sections is like the reactor. Another section would be the beginning of the engine room or the beginning of the command and cruise quarters, you know, battery compartment you know, section, and they just weld them all together until whoop, you have a whole submarine. Then you wheel it out and dunk it in the water. All right, it's two class by the numbers. It's powered by a Rolls-Royce pressurized water reactor. Produces, uh, yeah, about 20 megawatts. It's a significant power increase over the Trafalgar class. They also have diesel generators on board because that's going to be one, your backup power source, and also just for hotel loads. And then, of course, it does have a battery. 7,400 tons, like I said, can go 30 knots. That's just the public number. And the public test depth is 980 feet, probably deeper than that in reality. Uh, the 38 weapons, like I said, can shoot the Spearfish Mod 4 heavyweight torpedo. Uh, Spearfish arguably better than the ADCAP. There is one aspect of the Spearfish that I'm aware of that is better than the ADCAP, but the performance otherwise is pretty much the same. Torpedo upgrade uh, to Mod 1 in 2024. We'll see if that happens. There's a lot of um, 
a lot of systems are behind and the spearfish might be behind might also be behind but they are going to be improved uh, it does have mine laying capability that's a good point and a mine takes up one half of one stow depending on the type of mine but it's possible that you could for every stow that has a single tomahawk take off the tomahawk and put on two mines yeah so they have let's go over the sensors they have the i-band navigation radar which is just standard navigation radar it is low probability of intercept but still um, it's going to be picked up by most radar receivers out there they have uh, the resm and the cesm that's for um, you know spying and listening on other transmissions the 2076 integrated sonar suite has flank arrays uh, i'm sorry just arrays in general all over the submarine including the flank so you have a bow array, a flank array, a fin array, which can be on the uh, sail and on the rudder, and then, of course, a towed array. BAE, that makes the submarine, also makes the combat system that links all of these systems together, whether it's in radio, fire control, sonar. All of those systems are on the same network, and that's called a combat system. They also use Link 11, Link 16 for talking with other NATO ships and each other. Uh, the Atlas Deso 25 Echo Sounder is simply a fathometer. It has a secure mode that's very quiet and very hard to detect. And then it has like a regular mode where you can just ping and, you know, you get a good measurement of where the bottom is so you don't hit it. And then, of course, the CM-10 Optotronics Mast. All right, so here's the Rolls-Royce P uh, pressurized water reactor. Very simple uh, diagram of how it works. Uh, the best description I have for a any nuclear power system is using one steam kettle to heat up water that is then sent to another kettle that we call a, a heat exchanger or a steam generator. And that heats up a second loop that never touches the first loop physically. And that second loop of water that gets heated up into steam is what actually turns the turbines and makes the uh, prime mover turn, that turn, turns the screw. So notice how you have an orange loop and you have a blue loop. Those are both uh, water but because the water in the orange loop is in a pipe, it never mixes with the blue water. And that's one reason why reactors are so safe is that you could drink that water in the second loop. It's, there's no radioactivity in it whatsoever. Uh, I still I don't recommend it, <laughs> but you could do it. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, at full power, she's making 145 uh, megawatts. Uh, driving that steam turbine, though, uh, for the pump jet, it's it's 20 megawatts. So lots of power in reserve to do things like make electricity and other things. And it has a core design that's core H, has a life of about 30 years, which essentially means uh, she won't need to be refueled. Like a 30-year lifespan for a submarine is standard. Uh, they're probably going to push them out to 40-year life. And there's always extra life at the end of these reactors. So essentially, they won't have to cut her in half and refuelers is, is the purpose of that. It's a very good design, very high power. Six times the power of the uh, generation one reactor that they have on the Trafalgar. All right, so here's that UAA-4 RESM, manufactured by, uh, I keep calling this company Thals. I'm told it's uh, Talos, Talos is how they actually say it. All right, it covers all bands from one to 40 gigahertz. Basically, it's omni band, you know, all the way up to 40 gigahertz. It's direction finding down to one bearing. Uh, NATO name is Watchdog. They stick this thing up, and if you're transmitting anything from a radio signal to a radar, they're going to get a bearing of what direction that's coming from and the signal strength that it is. And if it has communication on it, they can stick up the CESM, which we'll get to in a second, and, uh, and record it. So here's the type uh, 1007 radar. It's just a navigation radar. Uh, peak power 25 kilowatts beam width is less than one degree solid state receivers and uh, tracking capability is 50 automatic tracks 20 manual pretty standard stuff optotronic mass this is uh basically the periscope but non-penetrating like i said has full three three axis so it looks in a circle can also look up and down so you're looking all over the place it does have true hd color and it has IR capability, but when you go to IR, you have a reduced resolution. It also has reduced uh, acoustic visual and radar and thermal detection. Something that's interesting about periscope mast and antennas as you raise them, they're often as warm as the boat is. And so these are made so that they don't carry the IR signature of the boat above the waterline, because then it would stick out like a sore thumb to anybody with an IR 
you know, binoculars or IR receiver, this thing would show up like a flare. So they intentionally cool these so that when you stick them up out of the water, they're as cool as the background, as the water that it's in. All right, 2076 Sonar Suite, manufactured by BAE Systems and Talos UK. It's in an integrated active and passive submarine sonar, uses a conformal array, has a multi-site ultra high frequency intercept array. So that would be like a passive array. Uh, it could also be used for mine detection, which would be active passive and uh, large scale passive flank arrays. The flank arrays are really very good. That's that was a big generational leap whenever they began installing those on these. They did it on the American boats. They're very popular in all, pretty much all modern submarines now. Uh, the, those flank arrays are very good. It's like having a towed array deployed all the time because it's attached to your submarine instead of being towed behind you. So this IOC to 1995 for the Trafalgar class, the sonar system, and in 2005 for the Astute class. Very good sonar system. Okay, here's the OE564 SATCOM for talking to satellites that communicate everywhere else. Manufactured by Raytheon. Submarine is a high data rate. HDR mass is what we called it in the U.S. Navy. And uh, pretty much provides everything. You can, you know, receive and transmit at the same time. Uh, there are secure modes. There's burst capability. Uh, so if you wanted to send a lot of data without being detected, you could send it in like a millisecond, you know, just burst it up to the uh, satellite. And if the people that are trying to intercept that aren't paying attention, they could miss it real easily. Plus the mast itself is very hard to detect via radar. I like this last note here that Tafon put in it says the re near real time Tomahawk land detect missile strike targeting data and mission data update file transfers for the missile management. The new version of the Tomahawks can update their target in flight uh, multiple times and this mast will do it. So they, they can launch on one target and if that target is somehow moving or disabled and they want to redirect, they can do it in flight in real time. Here's the Atlas uh, DESO or DESO 25 Echo Sounder. It is a fathometer. There you can see the bottom as it passes past the uh, submarine. It's basically looking straight down. Uh, has a depth range of 6,000 meters, which is very deep. You know, they have low frequency all the way down to 3.5 kilohertz up to 50 kilohertz. And a high frequency all the way up to, what is that? 1,000 kilohertz, which would be a megahertz. You're not detecting that. It's not going very far sideways whenever you have it that narrow of a beam. Whenever you're thinking of fathometers and you see the higher frequencies, that's how small, how pinpoint straight down the beam is becoming. The higher the number, the more fine that ping is. So the 3.5 kilohertz relative to the high frequency would be a very fat ping, you know, going down almost like a cone shape. Whereas the 100 kilohertz to 1000 kilohertz, that's a very fine pinpoint thing. And the problem with that at higher frequencies is that if it's very deep water, it's very likely that your submarine has moved outside of that ping by the time it gets echoed back up to you from the bottom. So yeah, you would say, why not just stay in the highest frequency all the time? Well, in very deep water, you you would get no, no return. You need to have a little bit of thickness to the uh, transmission in some situations. And that's just one of many. Okay, Spearfish Heavyweight Torpedo. It's a very good weapon. It's, I, it would be unfair to call it the Royal Navy's version of the ADCAP because there are some significant differences, uh, specifically with the rear end, the, the, the engine part of it's completely different. So uh, it's effective against both double-hulled submarines and surface contacts. And why that's important is that a double-hulled submarine, if it gets hit with a lightweight torpedo, there is a chance that the lightweight torpedo will only damage the outer hull and not do significant damage or you know, catastrophic damage to the inner hull. It wouldn't be good for the submarine, but there's a chance it would survive that. This weapon, if it hits something, it's going to sink it. This could kill a carrier. It is a big, fast torpedo. 70 knots is the public speed. Yeah. Um, 300 kilogram warhead of the PB, PPX-104. Uh, copper wire guided, autonomous, active passive homing. It has uh, an acoustic and pressure fuse, which means if it gets close to you, it'll go off. But if it actually hits you, it'll go off too. I like the acoustic fuse because it can drive past a, um, or along the side, I should say, of a carrier or a surface ship. And whenever it gets to the engine room at the rear end of it, where 
probably is going to be the loudest part of the ship. It'll wait till that moment to explode. So it explodes under your engine room rather than say your bow. All right. Tomahawk block four tech. Uh, Tom, there's so many versions of the Tomahawk. It's uh, they're, they're hard to keep track of here, but this one is land attack and uh, superseded the Tomahawk that were uh, used in the Gulf war. Uh, this one's block four, probably the latest block. I know there's an anti-ship block too. I should mention that the United States has just authorized for submarine use. Uh, we had that a long time ago, but for treaty reasons, uh, they took it off the submarines in the nineties. Well, those are back now because Russia violated a lot of treaties or just basically stopped abiding by them. And so they're back on the American boats. I believe they're back on the Royal Navy boats if they want them. I don't know if they do, but they shoot the Tomahawk land attack variant. All right, here's the artful. I love this cutaway. This is this is a great addition to it. This is a great fact sheet. If you want to take a screenshot of this, please do. And uh, this has everything you need to know about it, about the submarine. Got the engine room there in the back. I love how they labeled them. Like the engine room is A, the t main turbines are B. Uh, this is an artist rendition, so it's not exact, but they do have the locations properly labeled. And that's really what matters here. Uh, visual mass, the control room are right beneath where the masks come and go. That's more of a tradition than anything else because it used to be the periscopes would go right into the control room. So of course the control room was right, right under the sail, but since they're non-penetrating now, technically you could have the control room anywhere you wanted, but everyone's just used to it being there. And I want you to take a look at H, look at how big H and J the, the living room and the torpedo room are like they can put a lot of weapons in there. All right, great addition to the uh, brief. All right, final thoughts, the Astute class. Man, simply the most advanced submarine in the Royal Navy, hands down. They're gonna have seven of them, five of them are uh, available right now. It is the backbone of the Royal Navy submarine fleet, of course. Um, all the boats are built in the same place by the same company. They all have the same you know, capabilities in terms of weapons and uh, the same powertrain. And uh, the fact that it carries 38 weapons and it could carry more than that with the mines, like I told you, uh, is, is pretty impressive. This is a very good submarine and I would not be, I would not want to be on the wrong end of this, of the astute class. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening, everybody.